So first of all, it's awesome to be here. As mentioned, it's definitely a much more comfortable arena than being you know, on the stage you know, surrounded by you know, all those kids. But it, it was great. It was awesome. I think we had a lot of great engagement. And I look forward to, you know, again, hearing uh, what some of them thought. So um, I have thus far now done some presentations with various, you know, school district at like, you know, levels where you've got multiple like administrators and people with curriculum and technology and all that. And, you know, I'm really proud to say like, you know, the, really the schools districts that we've worked with thus far have been ones like yours that is very well respected. So Fairfax County Public Schools outside Washington, D.C., um, their, their headquarters office is 300 people. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit bigger, um, but also in Syracuse. Syracuse, New York, and um, and then in Wake County down in the Raleigh area. And I just had a meeting recently in Moore County, which is my home county where I live right now, which is Pinehurst, Southern Pines area, um, right near Fort Bragg. So um, so it's awesome to be here today. What I'd like to do, and I know we don't have tons of time, so what's our hard stop? Is it 11 o'clock or so? Right around, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run through, the slide deck we're gonna go through here typically when I do, and I lead a professional development for teachers, counselors, principals, staff, um, and we go in either partner with a school or sometimes we'll go in and like on November 29th, I'm going back to Syracuse, November 30th, going back to Fairfax County and each school that is interested in partnering with the Positivity Project, the following year we'll send five people, one administrator, you know, one counselor or staff member you know, responsible for helping, you know, with the whole child focus. And then three, ideally, of the most influential teachers uh, in the building, because we know, um, and you'll hear me say this before, we're not a program. We are a nonprofit. We are a partner. We have a strategy. We provide training and resources and confidence and inspiration. But, like, we do not like to say that we, that we have a... Um, you know, the, again, that we're a program because immediately the kind of people kind of like I've gotten this feedback from a lot of people in the education space that it's like it feels more um, transactional and more like, OK, we're buying this from you or using it and there's no cost to partner with the Positivity Project. The only cost that's incurred is, is around trainings that we do. So beyond that, like everything that we provide, all of our digital resources, all the support that we provide from social media and all that, it's it's we do it as a nonprofit, you know, for free for our partner schools. So um, with that being said, this right here is going to be a very condensed version of that, but I want to run through a lot of the research behind the Positivity Project. I want to run through uh, the 24 character strengths, what our strategy is, and how we measure our effectiveness, and, and all those kinds of things that I think and I hope you're thinking about as you sit in your chairs right now. All right, so here is um, an overlook of the agenda. Um, and the goals for today, we're going to talk a little bit about the world at 2030. So asking you to sort of stop, step back and think about, you know, kids who are in kindergarten or in first grade right now or the high school class of 2030, right? So what does it um, look like? We're going to talk about the research. We're going to talk about positive psychology. We're going to talk about character, the 24 character strengths, and then what the positivity project is, right? So it's like, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to kind of go through. Right. So here are the objectives I'd really like you to walk away here today with. First and foremost, know the four pillars of positive psychology. Understand the character strengths that make up you know, the, uh, our character. Understand what the Positivity Project's mission is. And then perhaps more importantly, what our vision is. What are we building to? What are we working towards? What is the whole reason for our existence and why we want to scale from 33 partner schools this year to 200 next year to 500 eventually to um, we do envision ourselves um, you know, in a decade from now saying, if you're not implementing the positivity project at our schools, then what are you doing? Like that's, that's where we believe we can get to and where frankly our society needs us to get to. Um, and last, we're gonna walk away with an overview of what the implementation looks like, um, especially at the elementary and middle schools. Um, and I'll say uh, something around the, the high schools is we wanted to really kind of maybe get there in two years. And I've been getting a lot of pressure from a lot of schools around this. And so we are going to partner and we're going to pilot the Positivity Project in 10 high schools next year. Three of them from Fairfax County, two from Syracuse, New York, two from Raleigh. And there's sort of you know three spots still opening. So it's something I know we mentioned talking and perhaps you know, to Grand Blank High School about as well. But basically, you know, we don't know exactly what it looks like in high school. We know that it's got to be student led more than certainly in uh, elementary school. Um, and in middle school, but there is a component of, I think there's a role of an emphasis on social media that it plays, uh, et cetera. But what I'm gonna talk to you today is gonna be really more focused on the implementation uh, at the elementary and middle schools um, to date. 
Right. So background briefly, I'm a 13 year Army veteran. I graduated West Point, as Jeremy mentioned, in 2002. And uh, it was in a military intelligence officer. I still am. I'm in the reserves. Um, in the summer, I teach psychology and leadership as an assistant professor at the United States Military Academy. Um, this here comes from Afghanistan, uh, my last deployment uh, in 2009. And um, again, uh, I am not I, uh, an educator. My wife was. She taught in inner city Dallas. Um, she taught in the suburbs of Austin, and then she taught in heavily um, uh, ELL uh, population in uh, outside of uh, uh, Robbins, North Carolina. So she's got this uh, eclectic background of where she has taught, and she's always like the voice of the te advocating on behalf of teachers. You know, you know, when I'm saying like, what about this? What about that? She's like, don't make more work for them. Um, so she's been great. And then uh, my co-founder and vice president, Jeff Bryan, his wife um, taught in Wake County, taught in Fairfax County. She was the dean at a charter, a success academy charter in Brooklyn. And now she's uh, a teacher up in the Albany, New York area as well. So we, neither one of us, while well, we're both army guys, we've got um, our better halves are uh, from the education arena. And again, are really provide a great, uh, since the very beginning, a great balance to our perspectives. Um, so real briefly, just a word about the power of positive language. This is Mrs. Flynn. You might guess this is the 1980s by what she's wearing. Um, you know, but this is my, my report card in kindergarten. Mike, I've enjoyed having you in class. You're a wonderful little boy, and someday you will be a leader of men. Go Boston Celtics, Mike or uh, Mrs. Flynn. And um, that, that came from the fact that, you know, I liked Larry Bird. I know there are a lot of probably Pistons fans in here like, ah, like, but I, you know, I was a Larry Bird fan growing up and Jordan, but, you know, uh, between the two, I was, I was Larry Bird. And so, you know, we had this common bond between the Celtics. No, that's not why our color is green in the Positivity Project. I know there's some Spartans in here, I'm sure of it, you know, um, to counter the maize and blue. But, you know, we, we uh, th that was it. And it goes to show, and I, I didn't know what the word leader meant. I don't even remember her telling me this or her writing this, but my parents did. And they saved this report card for me and they showed it to me, you know, when I was starting in probably third or fourth grade and reminding me that I had leadership potential. Um, and leadership is one of the 24 character strengths. Um, and this is important because I think it's, it shows the power, especially at a young age, of positive language in our life. And we'll talk about this later, but the, uh, the idea of as much as you can possibly use positive language, the better. So instead of saying, stop being mean, say, hey, start showing more kindness. Um, you know, like wherever you can possibly find a more positive way to say things, um, it's like anything. It's like learning how to fly a, a helicopter. It's like playing a sport. It's like anything that requires time. It doesn't happen overnight. Trust me, I've tried over the past couple of years, even with my parenting, with my kids, I still catch myself, you know, going to the, stop doing that. It's like, no, no, no. Like, let's have a conversation and talk about why you should be doing the good thing instead of stop doing the bad thing, right? But this goes to show, and when I applied to West Point, uh, this is what I wrote my statement of purpose on, that when I was six years old, my teacher uh, saw leadership potential in me, and I wanted to try to fulfill that, you know, um, to the best of my ability. So. Again, the power of positive language, one of, my, one of my many personal stories that we all have, undoubtedly where everyone is here today and you've arrived at where you're at successful in your careers, undoubtedly because of the influence and how people have poured into you and lifted up your own expectations and your own beliefs in you. Right, so what is the Positivity Project? Um, you know, we are basically empowering America's youth to build better relationships by seeing the character strengths in themselves and others. And at the end of the day, really it boils down to that one word, relationships. And we'll talk about this later, but we know from the research and the data that relationships and our ability to function on a team, our ability to relate with one another, it's not just a function of that's how you're happy, which is true. The number one positive psychology research shows it's the number one driver of life satisfaction. But it also goes to show when you look at cognitive and non-cognitive skills, that your non-cognitive skills are a better predictor of your earning potential. Right? You're, you may not be the smartest person, you may not have the highest grades, but you know, if you can function well on a team and you can be a good member of a team, um, it's going to not only help you be happy, it's going to help you to be successful, right? So again, the ideal is that you are very high in the cognitive and the non-cognitive sides, right? Um, but I do believe that I think that there's been a big sh you know, shift in an emphasis, especially in the past 15 years in education, where there's been a heavy emphasis on the cognitive side, on test scores and on grades. Um, and while those are important, I think my personal assessment from where I see, again, someone who is agnostic to a lot of this and was serving in the military while a lot of this was going on, um, you know, I think it has in many schools, um, and so I'm not saying here, but in many schools, it's come at the expense of the non-cognitive and the focus on how do we teach kids to build relationships, coupled with, at the exact same time, there's been the rise of technology, the rise of social media, and all these other things that have made it much more complicated to be a kid 
and to build relationships. That's why we've seen, I think, the, the significant rise in bullying and lots of other things. And in many ways, like the stance we're taking is kids need to be deliberately taught how to build relationships. In fact, in many ways, like they're going to come in knowing more about technology than a lot of their teachers will. Um, and, and ultimately, we need in some ways to teach them how to build relationships. And why? It's going to help them not only be more uh, happy in life, it's going to help them to be more successful in life. Um, and when you look at the data about why people get into education, no one's in it to get rich. You're in it to change lives and help, be, help set people on a trajectory to be successful and happy in life. So our vision is to develop uh, and to help, you know, to do our part as we partner with schools and we partner with educators and school systems to help to develop um, citizens and leaders for our communities and for our country. Um, and um, you don't have to look too far around, I think, lots of issues. Um, uh, you know, the elections here are, what, like six days away? Um, regardless of, you know, you know, stances people have on politicians, at the end of the day, you know, we, we have, in our nation, there is, there is not an overabundance of, of leaders who are thinking about other people um, and an overabundance of leaders who are high in, in the character strengths. So I'll leave it at that. Um, so you're going to hear me talk a lot about um, this notion of the other people matter mindset. And you're going to hear where this comes from, um, from Chris Peterson, who was my academic advisor at the University of Michigan. Uh, and, and he talked about the importance of that basically life boils down to your, your relationships with people, right? And how you treat people and how people treat you. So we, can, we built this graphic here, and we call it the other people matter mindset. I'm sure everyone here has heard of Carol Dweck and the growth mindset. Um, and while I think that's important, I, I do believe, biasedly, of course, that this is a more important mindset you know, to really um, to teach uh, and to build in people. So what does it mean? Really kind of five things. First, cheering on people's successes authentically instead of saying things like, you know, man, or thinking to yourself, is she ever going to not get an A? Is, is he ever not going to be like the fastest or the best? Right? Is, but authentically cheering on people's successes too. Supporting people when they struggle. Being aware and being tuned in to other people enough. Right? And I think in some cases, earphones are some of the worst inventions that have happened. Because like if, if people go inward and focus on self right? in, an, in an already a highly individualistic culture, especially when you compare us to many parts of the rest of the world. Um, but like we're not even sometimes tuned in to seeing when someone's having a bad day. We're completely, we don't even pick up and we realize when someone is not just having a bad day, but they just need someone to smile at them. They need someone to just give them a pat in the back and say, hey, I can, say, I can see you're not you know, having a great day. Is there anything I can do for you? Right? So a part of the other people matter mindset is training um, our minds to look for people when they're having a bad day and then to intervene with something as simple as a hello or a thank you or an offer for help. Um, number three is believing that together we do more, right? So again, highly individualistic culture in the United States, uh, especially compared to many other parts of the world. And um, very often, and of course, you know, I come from the military where they take a lot of individuals who come from various socioeconomic, racial, religious, you name it, every background in the world, and they mash you together. And they say, you know what? Like, we've got to figure out how we're going to make all of you guys work as a team. And the military, you know, they do some things really great. They do some things not so great. But at the end of all of this, you know, you talk to anybody who's been in the military, almost anybody, um, and they're going to tell you that, like, look, there's that sense of purpose that comes from knowing that people on my left and my right are counting on me. And that shifting people's mindset as often as possible to think about the team, whether it's the class, the sports team, you know, our communities, you know, your nonprofits that you're a part of, your churches, our country, like whatever the collective is, that if the collective doesn't succeed and the individual does, that there's room for improvement. Uh, the other people matter mindset is also preparing, arming students with the language, specifically, uh, re thank thankfully, research has given them to us the 24 character strengths. And those 24 character strengths are the language, not just the positive language, um, but it's the language that, to help us to not only see it in ourselves, but to recognize character in other people. And you know, you, uh, everyone here has undoubtedly heard of Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous words about you know, his hopes for his children to grow up in a country where they're judged by the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. Uh, and I believe this is an important part of it. Like, if we want to be able to judge people by you know, the content of their character, we need to know what character is. And in many ways in our country, um, we have lost sight, in my opinion, of what character is. And again, I revert back to the non -emo the, I take emotions and personal opinions out of it, and the, the master in psychology in me, you know, the, the, the researcher says, I want to look at the research. And again, we go back to the qualitative analysis over three years of work that was done to build out an, an understanding of what character is. 
right? And so how can we help people to identify the character in themselves and in other people? And then lastly is this mindset, and I shared some thoughts on this this afternoon or this morning with uh, the high school students, but is you somehow we've got to in, ingrain in people that every interaction counts. That everything that you do and you say, whether it's on social media, whether it's in your room, that every interaction counts because ultimately, and I'll share some more thoughts on this towards the end, um, you can't undo an interaction, right? You, you can't sit there and blow up on someone because you've had a bad day and then be like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Now we'll talk about later, you can use the character strength of forgiveness to overlook that and to sort of move on, but you can't undo something that happens. And so how do you deliberately cultivate a mindset that takes it a little, you know, guess what, that does make life a little bit serious, that every time you're interacting with someone, that it counts and people are paying attention, right? And you're impacting your relationship with other people every time you say something, or every time you do something. And especially with kids today, um, it's, it's about social media and the amount of stuff that they do on social media that is just um, often just a reflection of just, they're, they're immature, they're growing up, they're finding their values, they're finding their way, um, but they don't have this mindset, right? And it has to be, again, taught to them that everything you, everything you say and everything you do, it's not about you, it's about how you impact other people when you say something, when you post a Snapchat, when you do X, Y, or Z, right? So I'm gonna come back to this here later, but you see it like it's the hashtag, you know, um, on the back of our shirts. It's, it's the spirit of the movement that we are building. It's how do we build this focus on other people, okay? So now let's take a look at some of the research about the world at 2030, right? The world at 2030 is uh, obviously a long ways away, but if you think about it retroactively, we're thinking Y2K. You know, I was thinking, I mean, you might remember Y2K, right? Year 2000, doesn't feel like it was that long ago. I'm not gonna ask people to date themselves and how old they were back then, but you know, I was, I remember I was a cadet at West Point. Um, and so when you think about the world at 2030, it's obviously difficult because you're like, man, like, what is the world gonna look like then? There's all this talk about self-driving cars and what is automation gonna look like and what's it gonna do to the economy and to the world? There's a lot of questions that, people at the policy level are grappling with, but let's take a look at the, from an economic standpoint, right? So the real median household income has gone down relatively significantly. Um, and the, the reason for that, right? And I'll get to that in a minute, but, but this to give you a, a really important graph to understand. Um, any econ people in here? People? Right, so I was an econ major, right? But like, so this is like an economics, uh, economists at MIT and Oxford and other you know, universities look at this kind of stuff, they call this the great decoupling. And so all the math people in here can look at this in here and see the slopes of the line dating back to like 1950 with our productivity and the amount of people in the workforce needed to generate that amount of productivity were, okay, steady, steady slopes, right? And they basically mirrored each other. Like, right, like a perfect regression equation. It's like, literally, they drop, they drop, they drop, they drop, they go up, up, down. It's perfect, right? Until around 2000, what happens? Productivity, the slope of that line goes like this. And at the same time, the amount of people needed to do that not only doesn't, does it not keep pace with, it basically flattens out and in some cases go, you know, goes down, right? depending on the year and all that. But it basically, it's sort of flattened out. And this is because of automation. Right? This is because of something um, that we've been seeing happening and will continue a trend to continue to accelerate. Right? Oxford researchers predict that up to 47% of jobs by 2030 um, that exist today may be automated. Just think of lots of different jobs. If there are self-driving cars, you know, does Uber exist? Maybe, but it's probably not like an actual driver. Right? So all these people who have been brought into the workforce through Uber, like it might now very well become like an automated workforce. Taxi cab drivers, but anyone who drives a vehicle potentially, right? Uh, then you could look into all the, you know, all the people around, you know, like if you remember back in the airport in the 1990s, you had to go, you had to show your ID to somebody, they had to look at you, then they had to check you in, print, and now you go, you swipe your, uh, you know, your credit card and it spits out your ticket or even better, like you got an app and you go, oh, here it is and it's scanned and you just, you know, so lots of, like, lots of jobs that were needed out there to do things, you know, th those things are changing. And for good or for bad, uh, i got opinions, I think there's some of both, but ultimately it, it is a reality and, and that trend will continue. Whether or not it ever hits that 47%, I don't know. Um, but this is something I think that we've got to think about. So therefore, what jobs will be in demand in the future? So as we're thinking about um, educating and building our children as parents, as coaches, as teachers, as educators, what jobs are, you know, what skill sets are gonna be required in the future? 
right? So things involving, these are the predictions, by the way, from researchers, a lot smarter than me, right? Persuasion, uh, negotiation, group dynamics, framing and solving open-ended problems, human interactions, right? So the need for human interactions, I believe, will fundamentally always be there. Okay, some people might argue the Terminator, you know, Terminator 2 kind of people, like, oh, this is all, this world's all going to machines, you know. But in general, like, human interaction will always be something that we need to get good at. And if we're asking ourselves that how well are we doing, um, because of the the surge of technology that we've seen, how well are we are we preparing people to interact? Let's just say I've yet to meet somebody who looks at the youth of today and says they're better at how they treat each other and build relationships than they were 10 years ago. <laughs> and 10 years before that, right? And if you think about it, it's just, it's a, it's a volume of interaction thing. Um, you know, growing up, like, there was, when I grew up, there was like five channels on TV, right? And if you wanted a movie, you went to Blockbuster and had to get it. It was a real pain in the ass, right? <laughs> now you go, you hit the button two times and you're watching a movie. Like, so we just have so many more things to distract us and we don't have to lean in to our personal relationships as much because we've got lots of things that distract us, lots of things that we can divert our attention or our time to. Um, you know, before when you wanted to ask somebody out on a date, you had to go and do it in person. And now, like, you know, I, I know the stories. You ask people out on text messages, and you come up with ways to take videos, and you post it on sites. Like, I mean, and, I, and I'm not judging it as good or bad. I'm saying it's different. But I am saying that the volume of the amount of time, like eyeball to eyeball, person to person, the kids spend has gone way down. And I don't know a researcher who tracked that data, you know? But if you were to look at it, I mean, it's, to, in my opinion, it's just like it, the, the drop off has been so steep. Um, and you don't have to go far. You can go to a Panera Bread and look and see lots of kids who will be on their phones when they're there. And again, I'm not railing on technology. I'm a big technology guy, I'm a big social media guy. But I think it's important to have that dialogue of understanding like, how, if these things are the jobs, that, you know, a lot of the jobs of the future, how well are we preparing our children for them? If the idea of building relationships and understanding other people and, and having empathy and having the ability to connect with people is important, right? I'm not so sure that we're doing a great job at it. Okay, so let's look at some of the data that backs up why I say I don't think we're doing such a great job at it, right? Um, so the research shows, um, as, you, as you might uh, gather, right, what you've seen here is essentially two split sides of the coin. Um, so narcissism, since they started tracking it at the college level in the early 1980s, um, and, and this data is actually a little bit old, I think it's probably closer to 40% growth. Um, and then the other side, which is probably even more concerning, is the lack of empathy. Um, the lack of empathy being you know, your ability to relate to someone, put yourself in their shoes and feel how they feel in a certain situation. And if you think about it, they're really the flip sides of the same coin, right? It's an increased focus on self, and it's a decreased ability to understand and to focus on other people. I think this has been um, accelerated by technology and social media and our culture. Um, I think it started in the late 90s and early 2000s when shows like MTV's Cribs and things like that, I'm guilty of watching it, right? But you start looking at how the rich and the famous live and start seeing like, oh, that'd be pretty awesome. Well, I wish I had a you know, 8,000 square foot house. I wish I had these cars. Like, like, there's a lot of these things where I think a lot of people have begun to focus more on, well, how do I get to that point in my life? How do I become that into, and get myself into that position? Um, but what you've seen here, undoubtedly from the research, uh, and very clearly, and again, these trends uh, seem to not only be not flattening, but actually accelerating in the negative direction, right? So how do we, this is hence the focus on other people matter, how do we reverse these trends and get our children, oh, by the way, and our society to be more empathetic and to be less narcissistic, less focused on ourselves? Okay. Well, here's just a little bit more on that. You know, from uh, again, college freshmen who listed being very well off financially, you know, is one of the most important goals. Jumped significantly. Developing a meaningful, you know, purpose in life um, fell, as you can see, from 86 to 42 percent. Um, students were uh, three times more likely to agree than disagree with this statement. My parents are more proud if I get good grades in school than if I'm a caring member of my community. Right. So this focus on achievement, this focus on success, this focus on outcomes. Uh, has really driven, uh, I think, a lot of kids' mindsets around this where, uh, again, there's only sort of so many hours in a day, there's only so much of your attention and focus, and what's more important of how do I treat you or how well do I do it on my test? And they're saying that the message that has been reinforced, I think, by society, um, for sure, has been that it's more important how I do on my test. 
right? At least that's what the data suggests, right? So this is just a, a graph to sort of reflect that and show you like what it looks like. But people are more focused uh, or placing a higher priority on feeling good, i.e. being happy, or achieving at a high level, i.e. test scores, championships, winning, uh, than they are how they treat people. Okay, so while Americans worry a great deal about children's moral state, no one seems to think they're part of the problem, right? Um, we, as adults, uh, and I issued this challenge to all of us in the room, like we need to think hard about the messages that we send to kids. Um, you know, and if we want kids to be happy, we're better off helping them focus on developing meaningful relationships. There's our word in our mission statement. Develop meaningful relationships. That is what will help them to cope. That was what will help them to not only be happier, but also to set a bar um, you know, around their uh, reasonable expectations of what goals they should achieve. Okay? So, wait a minute, this is the Positivity Project, right? Man, you're killing me with some of this negative data, right, Mike? Um, so, let's talk about why we believe positive psychology as a framework, and specifically the Positivity Project, which deploys that framework, can help to not only address some of these trends, but really uh, also introduce some new ways in, uh, of thinking about uh, the way forward, okay? So before we talk about the Positivity Project, I wanna talk a little bit about psychology and positive psychology briefly. So, psychology is the scientific study of the human mind and behavior, right? And what happened was, um, it was founded, you know, in Europe, and Freud technically gets credit for like being the first one to be like a psychologist. He wasn't, but like the idea was that's where it kind of all began. And so what you see is it didn't really gain, it, it built very slowly throughout the 1870s into the 1930s. Then in the 1930s and early 40s, the purpose of psychology was determining basically who is batshit crazy enough to fly airplanes in World War II or to be a spy, right? That, and people started realizing, okay, we're gonna be able to psychologically profile people and better understand who they are and who's crazy enough to you know, endure and to be you know, um, you know, that courageous to do those kinds of things. Okay? So what happened was coming out of World War II, and mind you, we didn't have the New York Times that, like, on our app and, and on our phone, and we didn't all know like today if, something, if a plane crashes like, you know, over the Pacific Ocean, everybody knows about it by the end of the day. It took a long time for the world to realize the amount of evil and the amount of destruction that took place in World War II, Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini. Right? More people were killed in the 20th century by, by man than the previous 19th centuries added together. Right? And we're, we're talking massive volumes of people were killed. Um, it was driven by lots of evil. So all of a sudden people said, how did it happen? Like, we need to study this. Right? And so the, NI the NIH and all the you know, government started funding universities and started funding lots of research. And really the majority of focus, and that's why to this day the word psychology, if I were to give you like on a Likert scale, like you know, 10, 1 to 10, when you think of psychology, do you usually think bad or good? Most people go bad. Right? Because the majority of psychology in, in, the, in really between like the late 1940s until 1998 was focused on problems, was focused on evil, was focused on what's wrong with the world. And how can we better understand what's wrong so that we can improve it? There's a huge need for that. But Dr. Martin Seligman came along in 1998 when he was the head of the APA, the American Psychological Association, and said, time out, we need to also make sure that we're not losing sight of what goes right and growth. And so he built, he chartered in 1998 to some bit of controversy because everyone in the psychology field at the time basically sort of said, well, does this make me a negative psychologist? You know, and he's kind of like, yeah, kind of. I mean, if you're focused on all problems and not focusing on the opposite side of the coin. Um, and so it's still, you know, uh, again, a, a young field by the scientific studies uh, or by the scientific um, you know, terms, right? So again, it focuses on growth instead of disorder. It focuses on what makes life worth living. And the co-founder of the field um, since 1986, Dr. Chris Peterson was a professor at the University of Michigan where he won the Golden Apple Award several years. He was the, he's basically one of the best professors at the university. And uh, I had the unique opportunity of studying under him from 2009 to 2011. And when you think about positive psychology, um, there is so much that goes into it, but what I want to focus now on um, is basically just one more story, and then I'll talk about character. Um, so this is an IED attack, IED attack, improvised explosive device attack that took place. We had lots of these in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, still do. I just saw two service members were killed in Afghanistan um, this morning. Um, but lots of times there is explosives, and what you see here is you see two soldiers. And the guy on the right goes home, perhaps doesn't get therapy or counseling, doesn't talk it out, might turn to alcohol, 
might turn to, you know, it might be, have be prescribed to opioids. Relationships struggle, right? Perhaps ends up getting a divorce or, you know, getting kicked out of the army or leaving the army and just struggling in general, right? Worst case scenario, he goes on, loses his home, loses his employment, and absolute worst case scenario, um, kills himself. Right? So that's what typical psychology, you know, psychology generally tends to look at and say, what happened here? What can we do to ensure that this doesn't happen more? Right? So the guy on the left is in the exact same vehicle, in the exact same IED explosion, and goes back home, gets therapy, talks to somebody, has his family there and says, wow, I know that you lost two of your friends and you, were not, you didn't lose any body parts, but you, know, you got a concussion from it, talks it out. He goes back, he says to himself, holy shit. I'm so glad that I'm alive. And as a result of that, doubles down in his commitment to be a better husband, a better father, a better leader, a better person, a better citizen. Positive psychology says we can't neglect studying him. We need to look at what was it about him who, that allowed him to not just endure in those conditions of adversity, but actually succeed and thrive. Right? And that's called the flip side of post-traumatic stress disorder, which is called post-traumatic growth, or PTG. Um, and I studied, that's one of the things I studied at grad school. Okay? It goes, positive psychology goes far beyond optimism. It's not about ignoring that there's problems in the world. Right? We know that there's problems in the world. Um, it's saying that when you look at and you study conditions of adversity, that studying character, studying the positive side can help us to better understand and better get at those conditions of adversity. So here they are. The four pillars of positive psychology. Um, one of my favorite slides to sort of talk to, because I'm going to go back here to kind of point to it, um, because it really gets to the core of our strategy. So the first one is character strengths. These are the 24 character strengths that we're going to talk about here briefly that make up and sit at the foundation of the Positivity Project strategy. Right? These are things like integrity. Curiosity, creativity, open-mindedness, gratitude, forgiveness, self-control, hope and optimism. It's 24 things, and I'll show you here in a minute. Character is deep, and so often we simplify character. We boil it down into things like integrity, bravery, care, um, fairness, and kindness. That's kind of like, I think, what most people sort of boil it down to. And one of the things I think that Jeremy will speak to, you know, is that as you learn about positive psychology and you learn that that positive psychology says character is 24 different things, it changes your whole lens on understanding who you are and understanding who other people are. Why is this important? Well, because a strong first pillar, someone who has strong knowledge on their character strengths and especially on the character strengths of others, they are now better equipped to build strong relationships with each other. If your relationships are grounded in success and, oh, I get along with you because we play sports together or because, you know, you're really attractive or because you have a lot of money or if they're grounded in any of that kind of stuff, um, they're, they're not and they are very unlikely to be enduring relationships, right? When your character is the basis for your relationships, like the creativity, the curiosity, the kindness, the love, the integrity, when you see those things in people and that is what it serves as the foundation for your relationships, your relationships stand to be much stronger. And again, why is, why is a strong second pillar so important? Because it's the number one predictor of life satisfaction. Right? The number one predictor is not your earning, you know, or the, the correlation between life satisfaction and earning potential or in money flattens out at around sixty-five dollars to $70,000. That means people who make $250,000 uh, by the mean are no happier than people who make $65,000. Mo money, mo problems. <laughs> it's true. You know, I mean, you have more money, you buy more stuff, you have more stress. In many cases, you have people, more people vying for your time. Your time there's all kinds of factors that get into it. It's a very complex regression analysis, but uh, we think that striving to make more money is going to make us happier. It doesn't. We think that, that winning championships or succeeding in being like the valedictorian or being like the best singer or whatever is going to make us happy. It is if you got the relationships, if you got a strong second pillar, right? But if the achievements come without a strong second pillar, the research could not be more clear. You will not be any more happy than the person who doesn't have all those things, doesn't have all those achievements, doesn't have all that money, but they've got good relationships with people. Right? It explains why many countries around the world have got higher happiness quotients, right? 
even though they're much more poor than we are here in the United States. The third pillar, and why the second pillar is so important, is that is actually what drives our, um, you know, our relationships are what drives our positive experiences. It is absolutely possible to have positive experiences on our own, go for a run, read a book, go to a, see, watch a movie on our own. But in general, a majority of our positive experiences, the third pillar of positive psychology, are driven by doing them with other people. I know very few people who say, I'd rather eat dinner on my own every night than to eat dinner with you know, family or friends. In general, we like doing things with people. Even people who are much more introverted and prefer lower stimulating environments, right? It's still, the research shows, even people who are more introverted and who typically really value their alone time still are happier when they're doing things with other people. Positive experiences so often are the result of positive relationships. When a friend calls you up and says, let's do this together. When you do something with other people. And the last part here is you. It's schools. It's nonprofits. It's churches. It's sports teams. It's clubs. It's our groups that we form. Positive institutions and those that do and help to build a strong first pillar then drive the rest of the equation. So as an institution, the more effectively that you help to build a strong first pillar in individuals, the more you help them achieve a strong and build a strong second pillar, which drives more, uh, again, a strong third pillar, which is more positive experiences. This is why I keep going back to the relationship word. By focusing on our relationships, and again, how do you get there? By understanding the character strengths in yourself and others. So our entire strategy is grounded in empowering schools, i.e. four, to help build a strong one, a strong first pillar, which then drive a strong second pillar and a strong third pillar. Okay, so what is that first pillar? What is character? Right, we talked about it, the importance of that first pillar. Okay, it's a family of behaviors, thoughts, and feelings that are recognized and encouraged across all cultures for the value that they cultivate in people and society. When they did the research, Chris, Dr. Chris Peterson and a big, large team, they read everything under the sun, every major philosophical, historical, religious, uh, mathematical, you know, you name it, they read it, right? And they did it over a three-year period from 2000 to 2002, and they classified character, and they went through qualitatively and spent tens and tens of thousands of hours in aggregate analyzing and saying, this is what character is, because no one had ever done it. Everyone kind of talked about what character is, um, and again, they sort of simplified it, you know, your character is what you do when no one's looking. That's the character strength of integrity, but it's not character in its whole. Your character is how you treat people who can do nothing for you. That's the character strength of kindness, that's not character in its whole, right? And so they went through, and they went through all the literature, they basically did a lit review of history, right? And, and they classified it, and they pressure tested it, and they got feedback, and it went back and forth. And so it was led by the University of Michigan and the University of Pennsylvania, where Seligman and Peterson were at. And this is it. This is the definition of character, okay? Specifically, there was this emphasis on the fact that character is not just what you do. Character is not just your behavior. Character is what you think, it's what you feel, and it's what you do. It's the Venn diagram, ideally, character is the intersection between those three things. And so this is really important because if you want to change someone's behavior, okay, you can't just sit there and say, Start doing this. Start being nicer. Stop doing this. You're targeting the behavior. How do you actually change it? It all starts in the space between your ears. It's a conversation. You have to teach it. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, whether you're an educator, whether you're a parent, it doesn't matter. If you interact with other people, but especially kids, you have to teach it. Hey, my kid, he's six and a half years old, Eli. Hey, Eli, why, why did you just go up and push your sister? Well, because she was, you know, um, annoying me, or she was, you know, she was going in my room and stealing my Legos. Okay, so, so why, why is that not something that, you know, why, you know, why is that something you don't want to do? Well, I should be more kind. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, she's my sister, I should, maybe I should talk with her instead of pushing her, right? You have to actually walk people through, especially kids, and change their thoughts, right? So if you want to change the behavior, if you just target the behavior, the military is real good at just changing behavior by telling you what to do, right? Hey, do this, march like this. I mean, they're wrong, but like, that's how they do it. They target, the, they target the behavior, and ideally then they hope that your thoughts and your feelings come with it. But if you're, especially you're dealing with people who are younger, right? In my opinion, this is very much a, an education thing. This is a must-be-taught thing. It's you must convince their minds about the right thing to do. 
And if it doesn't happen, right, and, and if you're not happy with the behavior you're, you're seeing, and, and you think that you can continue to target the behavior, and this goes back to my piece around bullying, why I feel so strongly on this idea that telling people to not bully, and even if you help them to understand why, right, it comes at it from a negative lens, when there's so many more positive ways that you can approach it to get upstream. But you're not going to reduce bullying. You're not going to reduce negative behaviors, especially in an institution or an organization. It doesn't happen unless there's a cultural shift. right? And so how you get there, once again, is by really targeting the thoughts and the mind. Okay. So I mentioned before, this is how he did it. He took this three-year sabbatical. And they found, again, there was robust qualitative evidence um, that these exist across all cultures. And they've existed throughout all time. That's another really key factor about the research. If, you, if you're anyone who's interested in the book, it's like this thick. It's called Character Strengths and Virtues, a Classification System. It's difficult to get through. <laughs> it's a very academic book. Um, and uh, that being said, it, it explains where, where from history and the research that drives all this stuff. And again, there's robust evidence across all cultures. It did not make it into the cut of character if it happened in Africa, but it didn't happen in Latin America. Or if it happened in Canada, but not in Europe. Or if, it, it was, if they saw evidence of it in Asia, but not in the United States. Right? It needed to have, there needed to be evidence that these things, these components of character exist in all cultures. Which is our country is continuing to increase in its diversity. Becomes, again, another way that there's a common language and a common understanding of one another. Um, because, again, it transcends culture. The argument and the very clear the you know, theory of positive psychology is that every single person alive okay, has all 24 of these character strengths within them. We have varying differences. We have different profiles. You take the values in action survey, you'll get your own profile back and see that, you know what, I might be really high in bravery, but I'm low in forgiveness. Right? Or you might be very high in creativity, but you're kind of low in self-control. Right? You kind of see and you realize that like all 24 of these things exist in all of us. Right? Yeah, so it depends. Several of them take Yeah, and, and again, it, and this is very different. Uh, no, self-control -self is a big one, and it's actually our character strengths of the week coming up in December. We focus on it for two weeks because teachers have basically said that, um, that that and humility are two of the character strengths that kids are just uh, really need the most work on strengthening those, those components of their character. Um, and perspective, being able to see things from someone else's perspective. But the idea is we all have different character profiles, and some of us are, are, have a lot of a certain character in us today. Here's what the research also shows. All 24 of them are malleable. If you're not happy the fact that gratitude is your number 23 character strength and you're not a very grateful person, there's exercises, research-driven, that you can take to strengthen your, your character strength of gratitude. How to strengthen self-control, how to strengthen integrity, how to strengthen bravery. You can go through and there's exercises you can do to help you to build each different components of these parts of your character. All right? So this right here is just an overview and a look um, of what they are. Right? These are the 24. They are organized into six buckets. These buckets are called virtues. The virtues are organized, again, sort of by theme. So you see things like temperance and wisdom and uh, transcendence, humanity, courage, and justice. Right? So these character strengths are organized into these different buckets. We had these different little logos built that represent each one of them. Um, and we'll talk more about here. We're going to kind of like slide through these things real fast. And I would typically now in a full day um, professional development would say, OK, now we're going to look in, in, at your tables. Um, we're going to unpack your own values and actions survey results. So sort of share like, hey, these are my top strengths. These are ones at the very bottom that I think that you know, I could use some work on improving. Um, and, and again, like any survey, it's not perfect. It's not going to get you exactly, you know, exactly right. But in general, it gets your top ones and your bottom ones right. In the middle, there's a bit of sort of you know, you know, analysis where you're like, ah, you know, I actually think this is higher for me. But at the end of the day, it gets your it gets your signature, what they're called your signature strengths, um, right. And again, it's been taken by four million people, academically validated test. Um, so again, it's a really powerful um, tool to help you become more self-aware. But then more importantly, is you're interacting with other people to to see and better understand their character strengths, right? Um, so now we kind of go through these. I'm just going to blow through all these slides. Um, but we then go through the slides, and, and we go one by one. And we focus on what is this character strength, right? Humor. 
um, connection and purpose, wisdom, and then we get into perspective and love of learning and open-mindedness, creativity, curiosity. Okay, then we get into self-control, prudence, humility, forgiveness, fairness, teamwork, leadership, right? Character is complex. Character is deep. Character is who all of us are. And so if you're not deliberately sort of cultivating an understanding about what character is, then inherently, like, we're leaving, I think, a lot of opportunity on the table to help students to better understand who they are. So where does bullying come from? Where does a lot of negative behavior come from? It comes from a place of insecurity, right? It comes from a, from a lack of confidence in who you are, right? And what we, we love about the approach here is that everybody has all 24 character strengths, and everybody is very high in certain character strengths. How do we convince kids, especially young kids, of this in themselves? We got some initial data from our surveys uh, that were teachers and students ask, and they answer the question. They ask a simple, a simple question, I believe in myself. Less than, in, in fourth through eighth grade, our data from thousands of students, less than 50% answered four or five on that question. Basically, more than half answer neutral or I disagree that I believe in myself. Teachers, it's the same, about the same level when, they, when teachers are asked to assess their students. Do your students believe in themselves? It's a vague question. It's open, it's in many ways open-ended, but it gives us a pretty good pulse on, on these things. So, what does the implementation look like for the Positivity Project? Again, just a couple of high, high points here, right? We teach the character and we emphasize that it's more than just behavior. It's our thoughts, it's our feelings, and it's our behaviors. Unlike most programs, and there's lots of other sort of programs out there. There's Leader in Me, and there's Character Counts, and Character Org, and Character Lab, and Mind Up. And there's lots of other people out there who have got a view on character. Um, I believe if you look at the data and you look at our approach and how we do it, um, that scientifically, like, they are all leaving a lot on the table, right? We have got a very comprehensive and robust uh, data-driven, research-driven approach to how we do this. Um, and it starts with an emphasis on thinking about others, um, not just about you. Okay, focus on everything you say and do matters. So as we get into the middle school and the high school, again, the emphasis turns a lot to social media. Um, we believe in the power of social media. We believe that you know a lot of great things are happening in America's schools today, and uh, a lot of times you wouldn't know it because um, schools are, in my opinion, if I'm being <laughs> sort of blunt on it, I don't think schools do a very good job of communicating to outside stakeholders, i.e., families and you know members of the community, et cetera, about all the great things that go on in schools. And so, very often, what you see is like people react to what they see and, and they hear the negative because the human mind tracks the negative. And they hear something bad. Oh, I heard about that. And now that all the conversation is driven negative, I think you have to proactively start the conversation. And especially in a world where parents in school are often from the millennial generation now, but especially in the coming future, they spend a lot of time on social media. Uh, a lot of people like in their late 20s and 30s don't even go to websites anymore. <laughs> as crazy as that is. I, I can't you know the last, I don't go to a website unless I've got like a specific reason to go. Um, people spend their time on social media. So I feel that we've got to do a better job at effectively communicating the great things that happen and the great things that kids do. I saw so much goodness this morning, you know, in Grand Blanc High School, you know, with, you know, these girls. Um, was it going, the name of the group? GB yeah, GB Dignify. Like, and just seeing these amazing things, like all, and, and like sharing that and getting that, it's a struggle. Because it's, the world is busier than ever and, it's, and we're in a competition for people's time. But how do we share the good going on. How do you make that cultural, you know, that you know, that cultural shift where you get people to start talking about the good things? We have to inform them about that. If you want to transform what it is that people are talking about and what they're thinking about, like you got to give them, you got to arm them with the knowledge and those stories to tell. So we we're a big believer in this. You know, um, again, we we believe that we're building a movement as much as we are about building an organization. Right now, it's me and one other dude. Um, you know, and like we've got a lot of glass balls in the air, um, some rubber balls, but for the most part, there's a lot of glass balls that we got in the air. Um, and the last part that we teach is consistency is key. The data and the research on this is super clear, whether it's your diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's anything, you've got to make something consistent. Um, if it's not consistent, and consistent means basically daily. If it's not built into the culture, it's not going to work. So majority of um, schools that we see these struggles and challenges, they bring in like a speaker or they might have like one day of the week. It can't be. 
If you believe that this is important enough, it has got to be built in on a daily basis, and that's where our strategy gets in. We believe that this can be done like flossing and brushing your teeth. You've heard me use this analogy before. Um, flossing and brushing your teeth, if you do it for four minutes a night, that's all you got to do. Okay, generally speaking, like your teeth are going to be okay. They might not be perfect. You might get some cavities here and there, but you're going to be okay. If you brush your teeth for 25 minutes on Sunday night and you check out until the next week, <laughs> right, you're going to be seen spending a lot of time at the, at the dentist. So the bottom line is consistency is key. You have to think, you have to believe that everything I've said in the past 45 minutes is important enough to say, you know what, collectively as a school, and they've done this, you know, over at Indian Hill, right? And, and all of our partner schools, frankly, have done this so far. But like, you know, as a district, as, as a high school, as whoever partners, you have to believe this is important enough that you are going to make this a priority and that you're going to do it consistently. And again, you can achieve it consistently without carving out time from, con you know, from content, without you know, stripping away um, autonomy from your teachers. You'll hear a big part of this from us is, student, is, is teacher autonomy. We know the number one driver of teacher turnover in the United States is the fact that they don't have autonomy, right? We don't have a, we don't dictate and say, this is how you must teach character. We provide the training, we provide, we give, we arm teachers with the confidence to then train each other, to teach each other in the 24 character strengths. We then turn around and say, look, here's suggested resources, here's best practices, but do what you want because you know better than we do about what you need to do in the classroom to engage your kids. You know yourself better. You know your own character strengths better, right? And so this is, in many ways, where we differ from lots of people because we say, like, we don't want to standardize this. We want people to own this, like an American Idol song, right? Like, you can't sing it like Whitney Houston sang it. It's just not going to happen, right? So you better make it your own or people are going to go, oh, man, that's just not as good as her, right? You got to make it your own. We want each teacher making it their own, okay? Um, so this is our model, right? This is our one slide that we built that explains our strategy. It starts at the top with consistent exposure to character strengths, language, and concepts. Okay? That does two things. It goes down to the right. You'll see awareness and self-confidence. So we become more aware of who you are, both from a, hey, these are my strengths and these are areas where I need to improve, right? And authentic self-confidence comes from knowing who you are, right? So self-confidence doesn't come from people patting you in the back and telling you you're awesome. Self-confidence comes from within. Self-esteem often can be driven by other people, but self-confidence often comes from and is driven from within this innate knowledge of who you are and that you're good, that you are inherently good and that you inherently have strengths. The other side, right, it gives you this ability to appreciate and understand others, to include the differences. Why is she quiet? Why does he dress differently? The people who you think of when you start thinking of bullying behaviors and negative things that you want to never see happen to your children, to your students, to people in your schools and your system, right? You have to be able to arm people with the knowledge and understanding of how to see the differences in each other and to not recognize them as being, oh, she's weird or he's this and, and immediately using negative language, but it's really to be focused on, like, understand and appreciate that people are different. Okay? And, the, and the character strength language gives you the ability and gives you the strategy and the skill set to do that. Right? When you have that, when you, you as a person have got a strong sense of self-awareness and self-confidence and you've got an appreciation for other people, that is the formula for successful relationships. Go back to our second pillar, right? That's our second pillar. Third pillar, positive experiences. That is it. Strong relationships happen when you know and you're confident in who you are and when you understand other people from a position of character, not a position of who are they on the surface? What have they achieved? But who are they? And lastly, we believe the ultimate thing that we're driving to is an enhanced um, sense of community at the classroom and the school-wide and potentially at the district level, where people answer when you've got all kinds of metrics and questions around this, but like, how, how connected do you feel to your school? How proud of you are you to be a, a student at or a teacher at or a parent of a student at Indian Hill? And we'll have data to sort of assess it and compare it to like mean and, and we have two PhDs on our board, both proud UM grads, both of the focus in developmental psychology, one's at UCLA, one's at Wisconsin right now as assistant professors and they're leading our data collection and our analysis and we're taking a real sort of unemo you know, unemotional look at this. Um, we already have like initial data to understand like the areas where there's going to be huge growth and I just know it because I've seen questions like, I believe in myself, I believe and I, and I know my character and how low the numbers are. Um, and once we, when, once we reassess those kids at T equals five months and then, sit, and then T equals 10 months, we're gonna see huge growth. Um, okay, so here's our calendar approach. We focus and as Jeremy knows, like we start in mid-September and we go through early May. We have a calendar and we have to do this, we have to start in September because we have to synchronize all of our schools. 
um, you know, in some schools in the south start in mid in mid August, and some schools up north start in like you know September you know eighth, right? So we focus on one character strength per week. At some times, two character or one character strength for two weeks. Like around Thanksgiving, you know, it's a short week, so we do it for two weeks. Uh, in some cases, um, there are character strengths we wanted to focus on a little bit more because teachers have told us, hey, we really need a bigger focus on self control, or a bigger focus on perspective. All right, so these are, I'm just running through these. These are examples of the resources we provide. Everything we provide is digital um, so that we send it out. We've got Google Drive. You guys use Google Drive here, I'm guessing. Um, you know, so we, we register people into our Google Drive system. They then have access to all of our resources for each character strength of the week. Right now, we've only got one slide deck with a ton of different resources and suggestions that we do. But basically, day one is you introduce the character strength. You watch a video. You talk about it. Day two, you integrate literature or poems or you know some sort of academic way, uh, you know, some sort of academic subject into it. Day three is you do an exercise, a practical. So thinking Bloom's taxonomy, right? You're going up the, you know, you know, up the chain. You start applying it, and then day four is you reflect on it. And we have Positivity Project journals where we suggest to our schools that they, you know, starting in you know second grade, they start journaling, and then if, as they go through the system from second grade to whatever, you can see how their understanding of integrity and of bravery and of gratitude and of forgiveness will grow each year. Right? But we provide all these resources right now. Um, and, and again, we ultimately say, though, to teachers and to schools that we partner with, we want you to make this your own. We want you to integrate your own story. There's a ton of research on there that shows the importance of teachers building relationships with their students and how it improves the outcomes. Um, we know that a part of that is for a teacher to connect with his or her students. So we, we really push and we encourage them to share as much of their own personal story of, hey, when, did, when should I have shown forgiveness? Or when did I show forgiveness? And how did that help me out? Right? I know we're running um, short on time here. Um, it's 1101. Um, so we've read all these resources. And the final thing I just say here about building a movement, you know, is that um, we that's that's what we're, you know we're trying to do. And I mentioned before, Team Red, White, and Blue is the first organization I founded in 2010. Right, started in Ann Arbor. We had one chapter. Um, it's important to have a brand. So this is a shield with the universal sign for positivity, the plus sign that forms into a P for the Positivity Project. The colors of green of hope and optimism and endurance. We we worked with the creative team to like actually do our branding. And so like we've thought through and we've thought about this is going to scale before we ever actually launch this as an organization. Right. So the brand matters. Right. Social media matters. Research and proving that what you're doing objectively works matters. Um, and so this is Team Red, White, and Blue today. We're in 200 locations. We're 118,000 members. Um, you know, we are um, you know, continuing to grow at basically a rate of 100 new members are joining per day. Right? And here's the thing about movements is that people recognize them. And so this is about six months ago when we went over 100,000 members. The president invited 50 of our members to go to the White House. We're still trying to get them to do um, an exercise event with us. But um, that, that's uh, hopefully happening you know, next year. Okay? Right? Um, and this right here is, and interestingly enough, is the first lady has already picked up on what the Positivity Project is doing. One of our board members is, uh, is, knows her. Um, uh, Will Reynolds, and um, you know this right here is actually when I was in Detroit uh, doing some training with uh, one of the, uh, the public schools down in Detroit. Um, but you can see that people are already aware of what the Positivity Project's doing. And so our tremendous opportunity really sits at the fact that less than one year ago, bipartisan legislation, which almost never is passed uh, in these days, um, was passed to loosen some of the federal involvement on education. Um, you know, student achievement and tests are obviously super important, right? It's, it's obviously, you know, a, a huge thing. But, you know, we believe, and it's very clear to see that a focus and an emphasis on the development of the whole child, um, that, that, mom that movement is picking up steam. And the Positivity Project is literally, we are on the absolute sharpest tip of that spear uh, as a nonprofit organization that is emphasizing this and that has a plan for scale and has a plan to empower schools to do this. Uh, I can say with complete confidence, having surveyed the landscape and looked at other organizations out there, um, that we are, like, we are legitimately on the ultimate tip of the spear. Um, for where uh, in, in ensuing years legislation will catch up, as it always does, um, and all those kinds of things which take a lot of time. And for people who are embracing these ideas now and becoming the leaders of this movement, uh, there is a unique opportunity not only to impact 
you know, you know, the lives of the students in your district, but also your own lives, um, and, and eventually to build this movement out and to help us, you know, to really reach eventually millions of kids, eventually hundreds of thousands of t people in the education profession, and eventually building leaders for our, for our country in the future um, uh, that put us in a position to, um, well, I won't, I won't editorialize about my, just my dismay about the election cycle. Um, but, you know, that, that are really focused on how, you know, we as a society need to focus on our relationships with each other in a democracy that requires and lives on the free will of people. Um, we've really got to uh, not lose sight of the fact that how we relate and how we treat each other and how we interact with each other is critical to the success of our country. Um, and our country is, is comprised of communities. Um, and so our focus on, on helping to develop citizens and leaders for our, for our communities and for our country, um, in my opinion, has a strategic long-term impact on this nation.